So yeah, welcome. Uh, this is going to be uh, Trevor and I talking about how we built and uh, scaled the Thanos infrastructure at Reddit uh, for the uh, thousand-ish engineers we have. So hi, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm a backend engineer uh, in our infrastructure department. Um, I've been, a, a, like uh, uh, was said, uh, I've been a long time Prometheus maintainer. Um, uh, I've been working on Prometheus since it started at SoundCloud, kind of mostly focused on the on the uh, uh, exporter side of things, but I also do uh, kind of the SRE of Prometheus, do, uh, scaling with Thanos and other uh, things and providing, providing as a platform for our internal developers. Hi, uh, my name is Trevor. I'm here from Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, also experiencing a little bit of jet lag. Um, I've been at Reddit for about four years, uh, it'll be four years in April, uh, primarily in the infra SRE space, uh, and then about two years ago, uh, Ben and I spun up the observability team. Oh, we're fighting over no. the clicker. Yeah, I got the clicker. Okay. So, uh, and also, yeah, shout out to our team. Uh, without uh, the rest of our in, uh, infra team, we wouldn't be able to be doing this. Um, yeah, uh, like I said, Ben and I started this. We're up to about seven people now. Um, there are a lot of engineers at Reddit and a lot of services, so seven people feels kind of small sometimes, um, but we, we've really accomplished a lot. Um, also, our other infra teams and SRE teams have assisted us in uh, rolling out Thanos over the last few years. So, uh, at Reddit, we talk a lot about Reddit shape and how we try and make things in a kind of a cookie cutter way because we have a lot of engineering teams and a lot, uh, a lot of internal services. And so we kind of want to make things a Reddit shape uh, uh, so that it's easier for teams to onboard into different infrastructure. Um, we, uh, in our infrastructure, we have about 25 Kubernetes clusters. Uh, they vary in size from a few thousand cores to uh, tens of thousands of cores. Um, and over the overall infrastructure, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of Kubernetes pods uh, constantly be, uh, being created and destroyed. So Prometheus, of course, being a dynamic discovery, makes a nice uh, monitoring platform for all those dynamic workloads. Uh, all, of the all of the different services are all managed by different teams. Uh, you know, like I said, we have over a thousand engineers building different services. And so we don't have one central application team. And we need to make this observability platform as self-service as possible. Uh, and so before we, uh, uh, before Reddit uh, started with Prometheus and Thanos, we used a third party software as a service. And um, we had to, we ha uh, before we had Prometheus and Thanos, uh, we had a lot of stats team metrics, as was classic for the uh, early uh, uh, early days of Reddit. It was a Python service, uh, and it used we used uh, they at, apparently at the time used Graphite, and then moved to a third party SaaS when managing Graphite became too difficult. Uh, and but there were bottlenecks, uh, and the, the the typical problems with StatsD started to show uh, too many packets, uh, drop samples. Uh, sampling upon sampling to try and get the data down to a point where it could actually be shipped off to the SAS. Uh, and so uh, one of the things we built was we built or, uh, each service would have a telegraph that was kind of an aggregating proxy that would uh, eliminate most of the normal cardinality uh, by dropping pod and in, you know the no typical thing you see in Prometheus pod and instance those would all get thrown away and you'd only have top level metrics for a service and this all started to show its problems um, uh, and uh, because the we needed the data to find out are we having problems with one service uh, across the whole service or is it one pod that is or one node that is causing the problem and so we couldn't get that diagnostic information. Um, uh, also, between moving from Graphite uh, into the SAS, uh, they were also moving into Kubernetes. 
uh, at the time, because previously, like a normal setup, we had Puppet. Puppet was used to deploy all the services. There weren't as many services. There weren't as many engineers. It was a simpler infrastructure. Um, and so uh, in order to improve the observability, we needed an, uh, an order of magnitude leap in capacity, uh, or, or more than that, because there is this large uh, need for more data and more metrics, but we just couldn't afford to send it to a SaaS. It was just prohibitively expensive. And so today, um, uh, we had some experience with Prometheus because we were in a Kubernetes world. Uh, and so there, there was already some Prometheus in the infrastructure. And we did some design work and came up with the idea that, hey, how about we just use Prometheus for all the monitoring, not just the Kubernetes infrastructure. And so uh, Trevor and I uh, designed and built, uh, built out the initial prototype of a monitoring SaaS for the entire organization. We followed the kind of same telegraph idea uh, and uh, uh, to give each service its own Prometheus. Um, and this allowed us to really scale out uh, Prometheus as an underlying infrastructure for a large distributed uh, set of services. Um, uh, one of the bigger challenges for getting this service out to all these teams was uh, how do we get everybody to switch from a StatsD data model over to a Prometheus data model? Uh, the good news is, is we have a Reddit shape for that. Uh, we have a series of base, base plate libraries, and these are uh, basically the underlying microservice library that all the services are built on top of. And so we could instrument all of the base plate code with Prometheus at a pod monitor, uh, and then all teams had to do is upgrade their base plate and they would instantly get Prometheus monitoring up on their service. Uh, and so we kind of used uh, Prometheus and our base plate as an APM kind of plugin. Uh, we also, uh, in some cases, there are services that didn't use base plate or didn't want to upgrade uh, or couldn't upgrade because their code base was kind of in maintenance mode, abandoned mode, uh, legacy code. And so we, uh, also use the Kubernetes sidecar model to use the StatsD exporter. So instead of sending the StatsD to a telegraph, we would send it to localhost, and then we could use that to convert the data into a Prometheus metrics endpoint. And that also worked really well. Uh, we also started uh, needed to pull in data from our uh, cloud providers. So we have things like AWS CloudWatch. Well, what, how are you going to monitor that? The old SaaS service would do that for us. Uh, so we had to implement things like the CloudWatch exporter. Um, and now today we ingest a boatload of data, maybe not as much as Cloudflare, but uh, uh, we're, we're getting there. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Trevor here to now talk about how uh, we had scale up, uh, how we scaled things up. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, as Bartex alluded to, uh, we this talk is going to touch uh, a little bit on Thanos, a little bit on Prometheus, and how we have automated our Prometheus deployments. Um, ultimately, Thanos is the glue um, that holds all of this together. Um, so as Ben was first saying, uh, the challenge we were trying to solve was our lack of detailed metrics with StatsD. Uh, we aggregated out a lot of the useful bits, uh, sent it up to our third-party provider. Um, we've had some experience running Prometheus in the past. Um, we used it for C advisor metrics, container metrics, tube state metrics, things like that. That's how we got those into the SaaS. Um, we had problems with these Prometheuses. Uh, we would run one Prometheus per cluster, no HA. Um, the cluster would get larger, a large scale of pods, the Prometheus would crash. Uh, we'd be stuck waiting on the wall to load up uh, tons and tons of data. We'd be down for an hour. Um, there's a lot of pain there. Um, and so as part of this project, we wanted to solve that pain as well. Um, we, we've scaled up. We've got over 2,000 namespaces. Um, 
essentially we, we ended up writing an operator to solve this. Uh, we chose namespace as our, how we wanted to distribute or how we wanted to shard out our Prometheus deployments. Um, so each team or service or each namespace um, gets a Prometheus or a HA replica pair. Um, what this means is we wanted to automate this process so that we don't have to go set this up for everybody. Um, so our solution was an operator. And essentially, we just watch for new namespaces to spin up. And when we see new namespace, we set up the Prometheus pair. Um, these Prometheuses have sidecars, ship data to Thanos. Uh, we gain long-term retention S3 due to Thanos. And we're able to utilize Thanos query to query across all of these various stores, whether it's a Thanos store pod, Prometheus sidecar, or a ruler. Um, so for the next, next part, um, we'll take a look at this operator. On top of just creating Prometheuses for each namespace, uh, the operator will pre-populate common rules for our internal service framework base plate. Um, this enables teams to move quick. Um, they get shared dashboards. Uh, they all utilize the same kind of rule naming uh, nomenclature. Um, and so we can get teams up and running fast. For scaling our Prometheuses, uh, we use the vertical pod autoscaler. Um, we utilize this to dynamically scale the Prometheuses up and down, uh, well, generally up. Um, this has actually proven to be uh, quite a challenge. Um, scaling stateful things is hard. And um, a lot of the workloads we see is a team introduces a new metric, um, which introduces tons of cardinality, sometimes on purpose, sometimes by accident. Um, and what this results is an out of memory error with Prometheus. Um, sometimes our vertical pod autoscaler um, can see the gradual rise in resources and scale up before we hit this point. Uh, but many times we hit an out of memory error um, and we do have some metric downtime. Uh, we, we're looking at other solutions other than the VPA. Uh, essentially, we would love to track other metrics than just CPU and memory, um, potentially samples per second. Um, to try and like catch these things before um, they crash Prometheus to crash. Uh, other things we've put in for that are um, limits on each job. So scrape limits for Prometheus um, at some point, instead of crashing, uh, it'll just start dropping samples. Uh, finally, we do allow configuration per namespace. Right now, this is just the annotations. Um, at some point, we'd like to make this our own custom resource. Uh, this allows us to limit things like the maximum CPU will scale up to, max memory, sample limits, et cetera. That's the min. Yeah, as well as the min. Uh, and the min is, uh, as Ben was saying, um, we do, we are able to set the minimum value. Uh, this is really useful when spinning up a new namespace. Uh, if we have to take into account a loud ser large service coming online, uh, we can kind of set the minimum so we don't have to like uh, trial and error our way up to the correct resources. Um, so much of our initial tuning was spent on Thanos Store. Um, we actually haven't tried uh, the time series sharding, as Tom has mentioned. Uh, we've kind of jumped into the hash rate sharding um, due to its simplicity. Um, and actually, I, when I get back, I'm excited to try out the time based sharding uh, based on Colin's experience. Um, Colin talked about vibe based. Uh, sizing. Um, I feel like t-shirt sizing is essentially vibe-based sizing. You pick a few different sizes and you, when it gets slow, you uh, make it a large. Um, that's really where we're at right now uh, with our Thanos stores. We have our large clusters. We throw a ton of resources at them. Um, if our clusters queries are feeling painfully slow, we, we bump it a size. Um, we'd love to continue kind of iterating on that process and getting um, better metrics and better stats. Um, one of the, one, uh, we'll see a graph for it in a moment. Uh, one of the metrics we tracked uh, is basically just like the number of um, probe queries that are greater than one second. So we wrote some just like very simple range query, instant query. Um, we kind of utilize these to just see how quick our response times were. Because um, it's too hard, to, it, it can be challenging to do that using user queries because uh, we don't know what they're going to ask for. Uh, generally, the difference between each size is just the number of shards. Um, yeah, and we're using the hash-based sharding. 
Um, another piece we kind of we also sharded uh, is tube state metrics. Um, this is something that uh, we didn't really run into too many issues with, um, but we definitely had to shard it out in our larger clusters. Okay. So that was some of the scaling work we did um, kind of up front. I think I touched on a few of the challenges there. Um, now I'm going to talk about some more of the challenges we've run into running both Prometheus and Thanos at this scale. Um, so the graph on the right is that query probe um, that I mentioned. So that's the percentage of queries that took longer than one second. Um, the time frame here is from like February to June, and where it starts to spike up is right around April. Um, in April, we made the decision to disable partial response. Um, we were getting some like uh, unexpected results from some of our rules, uh, especially like aggregations, um, dividing by less data, things like that, um, because some piece of our query would fail. Uh, so we made this decision, uh, I think maybe about a week into it, we had uh, leadership asking, hey, can we turn that back on? Because it felt really bad um, having so many queries fail or take so long. Um, and what we realized is like we actually had a lot of query problems. We had a lot of queries that failed. Um, and this, this touches on that need for a uh, label proxy or a label enforcer um, because every time a user would run a query, this would fan out to every single Prometheus and every single cluster, uh, including all the stores. And if one Prometheus was having a bad time, the query would fail. Not just be slow. Uh, as soon as we turn partial response on, it would now fail. Um, and what these, a lot of times, or with partial response off, yes. Um, these failures weren't always pretty either. Uh, Grafana renders them as like showing every single Prometheus's external labels in a giant list, um, which is really confusing for our users. Um, and so, yeah, adding the external label forcer, um, essentially as a proxy between Thanos Query front end and Thanos Query, um, enabled us to give nice error messages when a label is missing and enforce that just a few select key external labels that will at least get us to a cluster or a specific Prometheus um, are enforced. And uh, with the release of that, we, we saw um, the time of our queries and the failures of our queries like drop substantially. Um, another major challenge we have right now is rule management. And some of this is based on the tiered architecture we have. Um, we, we encourage teams to run rules locally on their namespaces Prometheus if they fit into that model. So if their, uh, their rule runs over less than 24 hours worth of data and um, only needs to query data within their Prometheus, we encourage them to run it there. Uh, as soon as they need data outside of that 24 hour period, now they need to talk to Thanos store. Um, so we have, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we have we have cluster level rulers um, that run within that cluster, uh, and then we've since added a global level if you want to aggregate across clusters. Um, part of the challenge with this is uh, teaching our users where to run their rules, um, keeping track of uh, where rules are deployed or where they came from. Um, and this is still a problem we have today, uh, especially going through and trying to clean up rules that we have some uh, origin issues. Um, and so what we'd like to work on coming up uh, is some kind of centralized API for this where our users can tell us a rule that they want to run and we will figure out where it needs to be. Um, and then it'll also give us more control over tracking um, where they came from. Uh, finally, to help with alerting rules, we've created an uh, alert in alert routing service. Um, this service essentially will look at things like namespace uh, or other labels and figure out which page of duty um, team to route to. Um, this is really useful for things like uh, pods are exceeding their CPU limits, uh, pods are restarting. Um, these are just kind of generic infrastructure alerts. Um, and we don't want to page our infrastructure team. We want to page the team that's responsible for the service. Yeah, part, part of that uh, comes from the fact that even though we monitor each team's namespace, things like container metrics and kube state metrics, those still need to be centralized in a single Prometheus per cluster because in order to get the combination of labels to monitor both the container and kube state and, you know, kube pod labels and, and be able to do those joins, 
uh, all that data has to be in one Prometheus anyway, and that's not really shardable per team. And so instead of being able to write their own container uh, alerts, uh, we have to centralize and standardize the container alerts. Uh, so we needed another way to key the routing, not just from uh, the external labels of the Prometheus that their data was coming from. All right. Um, and finally, cardinality uh, is an issue. Um, I hinted at this earlier. Uh, teams will accidentally introduce a label that keys on user data or is a random string, um, and we'll see cardinality go through the roof. We'll see Prometheus is trash. We'll see queries get slow. Um, and this is just kind of an ongoing challenge um, that we have to deal with. Um, the other case is when, is essentially histograms. Histograms just generate lots of cardinality. Um, and we have teams that want to, specifically like services like GraphQL, want to monitor all their operations over a ton of different buckets. Um, and it, it just doesn't always scale well, and we have to work with them to figure out like what is the important cardinality uh, of their services. Um, these cardinality bombs generally result in Prometheus being knocked out, and not just like one of the replica pair, but both. Um, which uh, basically uh, makes the last six hours of data uh, not queryable until they're back up, uh, as well as like missing all new data. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we've added sample limits, which has actually helped reduce the number of crashes. Uh, and then the last piece of challenge I want to talk about um, is the VPA. Um, I touched on it earlier. Um, scaling by the VPA is hard. Uh, memory will balloon really fast with Prometheus. Um, one of the huge uh, features that uh, Prometheus released uh, was the wall snapshots, um, the ability to uh, notice that we need to trigger the VPA to restart the pod and for that pod to come up significantly faster uh, because it didn't actually have to read through the entire wall. Um, that, that kind of un unlocked a lot of the issues um, we've been seeing with VPA scaling. And I'll send it back to Ben. Yeah, so uh, one of the nice things that uh, we have uh, at Reddit is we do actually have a good open source culture. So we do work with our upstream. So we contribute to Prometheus. We, we try and contribute to Thanos. Uh, we're trying to do more of that. Um, uh, I've been a Prometheus maintainer for a while. Uh, and I'm trying to help onboard some of our internal uh, engineers and on our observability team to be more upstream uh, friendly and more up, do up more upstream contributions. Um, uh, a bunch of the functionality we talked about, like the label enforcer, is stuff that's on our rough plans to open source. Um, and maybe some more of the other internal tooling that we've built. Uh, actually, we were just... Uh, I was just chatting with somebody on the team this morning. Uh, we found a thing where we wanted to actually update all, all through history into our uh, S3 bucket, uh, all of the external labels that are stored in the Thanos metadata. There's no Thanos tool for this, so we had to write our own little internal tool. And now I think uh, you know, it's, that's the perfect kind of thing that we should contribute upstream. And I'm trying to get more of that uh, upstream work done. And I encourage anybody here to uh, work upstream as much as you can, because it helps everybody. Uh, more stuff that we're going to be doing. Uh, of course, there's still many, many, many more things that we want to fix. Uh, uh, trying to do anything perfect, magic, and scalable is kind of disingenuous. Uh, it takes a lot of work to run this stuff at scale. Um, uh, one of the things that, like, uh, Trevor said we want to work on the recording rules and alerting and try and make that better. The nice thing is we started entirely with infra's code, so we just need to work on organizing that code, um, whether it's coming from the service repo or a mono repo uh, uh, or automatically deployed from our instrumentation and centralized managed uh, clusters. Uh, we also have been working on tracing. Uh, uh, for our internal use, uh, but that's going to be a whole separate talk that uh, Trevor's probably going to give again. Um, um, one of the other fun things that we want to do, uh, teams manage all of the, uh, uh, we have the base plate metrics, and that provides uh, a good set of like HTTP and gRPC and database and client library code, uh, but teams can create their own metrics. 
and sometimes they get metric names uh, and they put labels into the metric name and you end up with a metric name explosion and that slows down Grafana's uh, uh, metadata JSON hugely. So uh, at some points we've had to go and notice that, oh, hey, the, meta, uh, the metadata JSON that it's trying to pull down to do metric name autocompletion is 100 megabytes of JSON and that just completely destroys every uh, uh, engineer's browser with too much data. Um, and so we, we, uh, we need to maybe do some metric name enforcement uh, or some other kind of automated uh, auditing of, of metric names in, in each namespace. But at least the nice thing is, uh, because we've sharded by namespace, when a team does blow up their Prometheus, uh, it only blows up their Prometheus and not everybody else's. And so it only takes out one team's service and doesn't interrupt any other team. So they can only hurt themselves. Um, uh, uh, we've also been uh, testing out the Go mem limit features. Uh, I just started doing this to try and soften the, uh, the out of memory conditions. Uh, we're doing this with the Prometheus right now, but I, we were just talking about like, we need to do this in Thanos in the stores so that the stores don't oom. Um, uh, they will just get up to their memory limit and then they'll just start GCing uh, to try and avo uh, avoid the oom um, uh, um problems there. Um, and then uh, uh, we have two petabytes of data, but I think uh, we can cut that in half uh, by using the vertical compaction. And so that's something that we uh, we've been wanting to uh, test and experiment with. I don't know if anybody is using uh, the permanent deduplication vertical compaction. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about that. Questions? Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for that, Weber. We have, we have maybe time for one or two questions, but in the meantime, you can, uh, another speaker can prepare. Anyone has maybe a question? Amazing. When you talk about limiting the number of metrics per namespace, what mechanism is that? Is that Prometheus is built in limits for scrapes or? Yes, uh, scrape sample limits. Uh, we set we set a scrape sample limit, but teams also uh, with our operator can self service override that with a uh, namespace annotation. Any other question from the audience? Amazing. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Um, do you plan, uh, you, you talked about the alert manager uh, routing service which you wrote, hi, here. <laughs> Hard to see um, back there. Do you plan on upstreaming that as well because this sounds really interesting to uh, me with many clusters happening? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it, that is something we could do. Uh, it's not exactly super portable. It's actually a whole separate tool that basically generates alert manager routing trees and puts it into a config map, if I remember correctly. Um, it's very keyed around our internal uh, uh, service database. And so it's not quite a portable project. Amazing. Okay. Thank you. Round of applause again. <laughs>